in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. The Apostle Paul writes a statement about the future that sends a, sends a shiver excuse me, down many of our spines. For we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Judgment before Christ is an inescapable event that awaits all of us in the end. For just as much He is King who reigns forever, He is Judge with a capital J. And that's a fact and an event that many of us have been taught in various environments, worship services, revivals, to fear and to be afraid of. But what if Christ's verdict is already rendered? What if we don't have to wonder what will be said when the gavel is hit on our behalf? And what if the very fact that it is Christ who passes judgment tells us something about the judgment passed down? See, today we get to observe and experience what happens when Christ takes the judgment seat. And what we might discover as we do is that the reality of his position as judge is not something to be afraid of, but is in fact good news. Our scripture this morning, if you'd like to turn in your Bibles, is John chapter 7, verses 53 through 11. Left side folks or right side folks, I don't think that screen's working, so we're all going to consult with the left screen today or our Bibles. This is John 7 verse 53 through chapter 8, verse 11. John writes, They went each to his own house, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery. And placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? This they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And she said, No one, sir. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. This is the word of the Lord. So Jesus is teaching in the temple again. And whatever has brought these families to the temple, the Feast of Booths is over, it doesn't matter. Because surrounding Jesus at this point is, as John describes, all the people. The activity in the temple is now dictated by the activity of Jesus. But John has told you this so that you know this is a public, highly attended scene that is about to become a public spectacle. See, while Jesus is teaching, a commotion arises. People start whispering, murmuring, looking over their shoulders. The Pharisees are here, and they've got the scribes with them. Now, the scribes are legal experts. They're only called on for formal trial proceedings. You don't just bring the scribes to anything, and you certainly don't bring them along for anyone. Well, have they come for Jesus again? We've heard several times they've been trying to arrest him. No, people in the crowd say there's someone else with them. As the scribes and Pharisees reach Jesus they set before him and all the people, the one they've brought with them, a woman. Her hair is down. 
She's only wearing a tunic. And her face is streaked, probably from tears, maybe from getting dragged there. This is highly immodest. It's shameful for a woman to look like this in the public square, no less. What's the meaning of this indecency? Teacher, the scribes and the Pharisees say, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Adultery. That would have scandalized the crowd. That's a violation of the seventh commandment, thank you very much. A profanation of marriage. God's institution from the very beginning. The two things God gave humans at the start of time was life and marriage. And this woman had just violated both. And adultery is one of those sins that still unsettles the modern conscience. In sticking with the Ten Commandments, we can understand why some children don't honor their parents. Some parents are not honorable. Plenty excuse murder, whether it's because of penal execution or the exercise of certain so-called rights. And a little healthy coveting, a little healthy jealousy, all that does is create ambitious people. Some of our best minds were people who probably were reared with a sense of jealousy. But adultery, that one still scandalizes. And this woman had been caught in the act. What's to be done with her? The scribes and Pharisees know what they would do. They would stone this woman to death. They tell Jesus, in fact, that Moses commanded us to stone such women. Such women, meaning adulteresses. Isn't that a cruel designation? To be forever identified by the worst sin of your life. We do this to people you know. A man can do his time for the crime he committed, but he will for the rest of his life be known as a felon. A label that not only summarizes his life, but ruins it. Good luck getting a job if you're a felon. Good luck being welcomed into local congregations if you're a felon. Good luck having friends, seeing your children if you're a felon. This woman is an adulteress. Her name, her family, her background apparently don't matter to these men. What matters is not who she is. Nobody cares. What matters is what she's done. She's committed adultery. And Moses, meaning scripture, the scribes claim, commands us to stone such women. Which is true, in part. Deuteronomy 22, verse 22, does say, If a man is found lying with the wife of another, both of them shall die. And that's a statute that's supported in the book of Leviticus as well. The scribe's judgment, then, is just. She deserves to die. But they've made a pretty significant omission did you notice? Where's the man? For that matter, where are the witnesses? If we're sticking with Moses, Moses also commands that a case against someone be validated by the testimony of two or three witnesses. And are we to believe that these Pharisees, pure among the pure, these scribes, the legal experts, that they were the ones who caught this woman? You know, for a formal trial, the scribes are there after all, for a formal trial, this sure seems pretty informal. Procedures being ignored, details are being neglected, scriptures being forsaken. This is not how such proceedings are meant to take place. But the scribes and Pharisees don't care about proper proceedings. They're not concerned with the likes of right procedure or attention to detail. Robert's rules mean nothing to these men. 
Their case against this woman is a Trojan horse for their more insidious intentions. See, pulling the curtain back on the desires of the woman's accusers, John writes, they said this to Jesus that they might have some charge to bring against him. These men don't care about this woman. They don't even, to a certain extent, care about the crime she's committed. She is nothing to them. Because who they want is Jesus. These men are desperate to silence him. Desperate to find any reason to squash his ministry. They are desperate to kill him. And if the public lynching of a woman is what it takes to engineer an accusation against him, so be it. Because the means justify the ends. The scribes and the Pharisees want to see just what sort of judge Jesus is. Faced with human sin at its most destructive, and it's hard to think of one more destructive than adultery, and aware of the judgment levied by the law, they want to know how Jesus will react. So they ask him the question around which this passage hinges. What do you say? And at first he says nothing. Instead, he bends down on the ground, takes his index finger, and starts scribbling. Now, this is not the sermon to consider what, or the better question really is, why Jesus is writing in the dirt. What interests me is that while he was doing this, the scribes and the Pharisees continued to ask him, Well, what should we do? What do you say? Hello? Hi? What do you say? Finally, he speaks. Jesus rises from the dirt and says to them and to all the people, let him or let those who are without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. Now, this is one of those Jesus sayings we're a bit too familiar with. This is often heard and often quoted, even by some of us, as a trite dismissal of human sin. You've used it as such. I have too. A loved one confronts you concerning your disposition. It's sour. You're being short with people, rude with people. You're not giving them your time or your attention. You got new wrinkles on your face from how much you've been scowling. And what in your defensiveness do you say when someone brings that to your attention? Well, let him who's without sin throw the first stone. The logic is I'm not that bad and you're not that great. And that's not Jesus' logic. Jesus isn't dismissing the woman's sin. This isn't some hackneyed teaching against judging people. In fact, Jesus is endorsing judgment against this woman. He's acknowledging, acknowledging, excuse me, that she has sinned, grievously so, and that a pronouncement must be made. But here's the thing. It may not be made by just anyone. In this familiar command, Jesus is not doing away with judgment, but establishing the criteria for the judge. The one worthy to judge this woman, to determine her fate, is the one among the crowd who is sinless before God. And after saying this, Jesus sits back down and resumes writing. The temple court is silenced. That must have been deafening. And the crowd dissipates one by one, beginning with the elders. You have to wonder if some of these men had already had stones in their hand. It must have been incredible to hear them hitting the sand. 
J. Ramsey Michaels calls this exit both dramatic and ceremonious, not soon forgotten. There they go, person by person, family by family, until Jesus was left alone, John writes, and the woman standing before him. Jesus was left alone. Can you hear what John's trying to say? The standard has been set. The one without sin is qualified to judge the woman. And by describing this woman, formerly standing in the midst of all the people as now standing before Jesus alone, John is portraying Jesus as the one who alone satisfies his own criteria. Jesus is the sinless one. Jesus is united, heart, mind, and will, with God. He can no more sin against God than God can sin against himself. For Jesus to rebel against his Father would be for him to cease to be the Son. It would rupture the eternal unity of the Trinity on which life is built upon. Jesus is perfection amid our imperfect world. Mind you, there is not a temptation we endure that Jesus has not likewise endured. Though where we have failed, He has and continues to succeed every time. He is unblemished by the stains of iniquity that cover our souls. He's untouched by the moral decay that infects our existence. We are leprous with wickedness and corruption. But the word become flesh is undefiled, pure. Pure not just in action, but in perspective. 1 John chapter 3 verse 5 says that there is no sin in him. Jesus does not have sinful thoughts, impulses, or inclinations. He is emotionally balanced. Jesus does not harbor resentment or jealousies. He is not petty or dishonest. He is not vengeful or vindictive. He's not biased. His perspective of the world and of us is perfect, neither too severe nor deluded, neither too harsh or too soft. It is just, he is justified in whatever he says about us. That's what separates him from the scribes and Pharisees. Their attempt at judgment was filled with violent, ulterior motives. That's why they had to leave. See, in accusing Jesus and by accusing this woman, they had accused themselves. Jesus' motive, however, is simply to satisfy the will of His Father with whom He's united. Of course, there is no one left for this woman to stand before but Jesus because there is no other name under heaven by which we may and will be judged than Jesus. It is by Him, Karl Barth writes, that the conduct of all human beings is measured. End quote. What then is the sinless Son of God to do with this sinner? This adulteress. Such women. What judgment does Jesus levy against this woman who sabotaged her family? Who's acted so selfishly? Who's irreparably, irreparably damaged the lives of her children? Who's brought shame upon herself and her parents who'd paid an expensive dowry for her, no doubt? Who has ostracized herself from everyone she loved and who loved her all in the name of some lustful fling? We return to the question asked by the scribes and the Pharisees concerning her. Jesus what do you say? And again, Jesus at first says nothing. He gets up out of the dirt and approaches the woman. How frightened she must have been. She hadn't moved. Some of you have been so scared in your life. You know what it's like to be paralyzed by terror. She must have been quivering. Breathless. 
What's happening? She asks herself, who is this man? And more importantly, am I going to die? Jesus arrives, looks upon her, and he speaks. Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And the woman, her voice choked by fear, replies, No one, sir. Your Bibles do you a disservice in translating that, Lord. It's not so formal. She does not know who this man is. No one, sir. And her judge declares his verdict. Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. St. Augustine comments on this exchange, quote, He who had repelled her adversaries with the voice of justice lifted upon her the eyes of mercy. And what warm eyes those must have been. While all the incompetent would-be judges desired death for this woman, Jesus, the righteous judge, chose mercy. But this is a, adultery we're talking about. I mean, doesn't Jesus know what she's done? He does. Doesn't Jesus realize the damage she's caused? Better than anyone. Mind you, Jesus is the one who saw Nathaniel under the fig tree, John 1. He saw the marital history of the woman of Samaria. You remember her in John 4. He no doubt looked at this woman and could see those past rendezvous. So then why does he not condemn? Because God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. But in order that the world might be saved through him. The word became flesh with mercy in mind. His vocation Giving him, given him by the Father, is one of saving, not of condemnation. The mission of God is not one of vengeance, but of love. God is not out to get you. He's not out to get you. You who, like a scared little child, try to hide from God... Afraid that if he sees you for who you are, if he sees what you've done, if he sees what a great sinner you are, he will surely condemn you. Jesus does see who you are. He does see what you've done. He knows what a great sinner you are. And his reaction to that is not cruelty, but compassion. It is not condemnation, but mercy. Mercy not despite your sin, but because of it. See, mercy is not niceness. Jesus is not just being nice. The mercy of Christ is not his pat on the back, oh, it's all right. It's no big deal. It's not a casual dismissal of your sin. Mercy is when someone with the power to punish chooses instead to pardon it is when, in an act of benevolence, a judge chooses not to enforce the just punishment for a crime. For there to be mercy, a crime must have taken place. You, like this woman, we, like this woman, let's use inclusive language, shall we, are sinners standing before Christ. The appropriate sentence for our rebellion is death. And Christ chooses mercy. How can this be? If my sin is so heinous, if Jesus sees the wickedness within me, my heart which is deceitful above all things and desperately sick, and if he knows full well the judgment I deserve, then how can he, the perfect, holy judge, be merciful? Where's the justice in that? Do I just get off scot-free? And more importantly, does that mean they just get off scot-free? He is merciful because 
to quote Karl Barth again, quote, the merited death sentence has already been pronounced and executed. It has fallen on another in her place and has thus been fulfilled. Jesus as judge can show us mercy because he has taken our condemnation upon himself. Christ received our sentence so that we may receive his life. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5.21 that God made him who knew no sin and not a speck of it to be sin for us so that in him we might be in right standing before God. The prophet Isaiah writes in, of the crucifixion of Jesus that in so doing he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. He bore our griefs, carried our sorrows. Condemnation was poured out and exhausted on Christ. With the result that grace and mercy and pardon and forgiveness are granted to you. In his crucifixion, Jesus, the righteous judge, pronounces you innocent. Innocent. What more then do your accusers have to say? See, some of you are here with the voice of your accuser or accusers ringing in your ear, reminding you of your unworthiness, of your blemishes, taunting the nerve that you show in being here in the first place. What are you doing here? Who do you think you're kidding? Do you think God is mindful of you? And if you think he is, are you sure that's a good thing? Do you think this changes who you are? You may even believe those accusers. So often those voices haunt us for long enough, we start to think they're telling the truth. We so regularly find it easier to believe the voices that say we are worthless than the voice that pronounces it's finished. But the crucifixion of Jesus renders those accusers voiceless. Christ has banished them. They have nothing to say to you. They have no further charge to bring against you. Indeed, they have no right to accuse you in the first place. Their indictments against you mean nothing. They're liars. There is no truth in them. And they've been exposed by such as Christ. His sinlessness has exposed the evil lying beneath their words. And by his word, he has sent them away one by one back to the darkness and the hell from which they've been sent. In levying judgments against you, they prove themselves imposters, charlatans. Because there is only one to whom God has granted authority to judge. Only one before whom we all will stand. And that one has expelled those who would condemn you by his death on the cross. The judgment that matters is the one he gives. Woman, man, boy, little girl. Where are they? Does no one condemn you? Neither do I.